Thanks so much. Welcome to the afternoon session of Asia Pacific Week. Uh, warm thanks to our organisers and conveners uh, for the invitation to RegNet, the Regulatory Institutions Network, to uh, come uh, today and share with you some of what we think is the most interesting research being done uh, here at ANU at the moment. Uh, I'm Veronica Taylor, I'm Director of the School of Regulation, Justice and Diplomacy and also its uh, core unit which is uh, RegNet, the Regulatory Institutions Network. RegNet's mission is to uh, produce regionally informed research that is grounded in evidence and that contributes to good governance, both locally and internationally. We're an interdisciplinary uh, research and teaching program all of our teaching is research-based. We have both uh, MPhil and PhD programs, and both of those programs are interdisciplinary. What we're going to show you today is a sample of uh, the range of topics that we deal with uh, and also model for you in a very explicit way the methodologies that we use to tackle complex problems, ranging from climate change to child welfare, from uh, peacekeeping to policing and security. You have a full uh, profile for each of our speakers today in your uh, Asia Pacific Week uh, booklet, but let me introduce them uh, to you briefly in the order in which they'll speak and thank them too for being here and sharing their research. We'll start uh, with a presentation from Dr Miranda Forsyth, who is internationally recognised as an expert on legal pluralism, uh, with particular expertise uh, in the Pacific and uh, most particularly in uh, the complex legal systems of Vanuatu. She'll be followed by uh, Dr Lennon Chang, who has uh, last year completed an outstanding uh, PhD dissertation on cybercrime and is now working as a researcher with the Australian Centre of Excellence on Policing and Security. Uh, then we will have a presentation from jo Dr uh, Judith Healy, who is recognised as an expert in the regulation of health systems nationally and internationally and has done a great deal of policy work on global health issues within Asia. And our final speaker will be uh, Dr Jeroen van der Heiden, who has joined us this year uh, from uh, a long association with uh, Delft University of Technology. Uh, Dr van der Heiden is an expert in the regulatory challenges of water, sustainability and the built environment, and he'll be talking today about the role of volunteerism in uh, tackling those complex issues. Once we have uh, the presentations, we'll then break for questions and comments, and then there'll be an opportunity for you to meet individually with the speakers afterwards if you'd like to do so. And we promise uh, to have you finished in plenty of time for the all-important afternoon tea. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, the main focus of my work for the past eight years has been the regulation regulation in South Pacific Island countries, in particular in the area of criminal law, although more recently I've branched out into intellectual property law. I've done a lot of work looking at the relationship between state and non-state legal systems in the region, and that has required me to work in a cross-disciplinary manner, uh, for example, working in the fields of anthropology and criminology, as well as law. And the overall theoretical framework that has allowed me to take such a broad approach has been the framework of legal pluralism. One of the, um, thing, well, one of the examples that I thought I would talk to you today about that shows that interaction between, legal and, between state and non-state legal systems is the issue of sorcery in the region in general and in Vanuatu in particular. First of all, where is Vanuatu? I understand that there is one Pacific Island student um, in the room today, but um, uh, I thought that I might provide a map for the rest of you, so you can see it there. Uh, sorcery is a major social problem in Vanuatu and indeed across most of Melana Melanesia. It's also called black magic or witchcraft. Um, for example, in this newspaper article in 2011, Chief Jacob Kaperi said, does sorcery exist, whether one is a simple gardener in their village or a highly educated individual with their masters in a white collar job, each Ni Vanuatu cannot deny it is very much part of their cultural heritage, a means of social control with dimensions of good and bad sorcery. 
Normally this is supposed to happen within a network, an agreement between the Nakamals, which are like the chiefly uh, communities. But today it has shot out of control. Uh, there are two general law and order consequences of a belief in sorcery. The first is that people are dying or being hurt and no one knows why, but they suspect malevolent intent. In other words, every time there is an unexplained death, an autopsy is really not very widely practised at all, then people are thinking this has been caused by somebody else. And that, as you can imagine, has led to a great deal of social unrest. There were riots in Port Villa in 2007 that were caused by um, people pointing fingers at other people, and also people living in a great deal of fear. The second law and order consequence is that people attack and sometimes kill alleged sorcerers. And this has happened regularly in the region. These are just some um, headlines from newspaper articles in the last year. <coughs> Adopting a legal pluralist approach to regulation means looking at how all of the legal orders in a particular country regulate a particular issue. So in Vanuatu, the three main legal orders are the state, the customary system and the churches. I'm not going to talk about the churches, just concentrate on the customary legal system and the state legal system. So the customary legal system is based on um, the idea of having public meetings that are chaired by chiefs of a particular community and they discuss issues in a wide ranging way. So the concept of relevance that we um, so love in criminal law is absent. Uh, proof is dealt with in, by issues of dreams, diviners sometimes are brought in, sometimes there are magical objects such as magical stones. Um, there's no presumption of innocence, so again a difference to the state legal system. And the aim of the overall meeting is to restore peace and harmony in the community as a whole. So the focus is not on achieving individual justice as it is in the Western system. In the Pacific Island countries, it's very important to look at customary legal systems because that is where about 80% of conflict resolution is actually done. The state often has very limited reach outside of the capital cities because, for example, in Vanuatu, there are 83 different islands. So it's just physically very difficult for um, state authorities to get out to all of those islands. However, the customary legal systems are themselves under a great deal of pressure as a result of changes forced by globalisation. The state legal approach to dealing with the issue of sorcery is embedded in the Vanuatu Penal Code, section 151 of which provides no person shall practise witchcraft. When the Penal Code was drafted at independence, the idea was to indigenise it, and so they made provision for custom crimes such as sorcery. But the problem is that they didn't take into account the fact that customary norms make sense within a customary procedural framework and within the aims of the system being, in other words, to bring back peace and harmony into the community. So having such a law doesn't actually work in the state legal system because of the problem of proof. As you can see from that provision, it requires proof beyond reasonable doubt that somebody practised witchcraft. This case, um, well, this issue actually went to court in the case of Melissa Clay and public prosecutor. And in that case, at first instance, the trial judge, who was an indigenous Nivanuatu, tried to do everything he could to adapt the Western laws to try to fit the situation. So he used the doctrine of judicial notice to take into account the fact that witchcraft had occurred. However, this was appealed to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal that was largely made up of expatriate judges um, struck down the um, conviction and said that th it was not appropriate to use the doctrine of judicial notice in that way and also made a number of other comments about um, the judge's reasoning. Since this case, perhaps unsurprisingly, no um, further prosecutions have been um, brought and so it's been back to the customary system to deal with the problems of sorcery. So directions for research or for legal developments, the work that 
I've been doing uh, is trying to develop a regulatory system where both state and non-state systems operate within their own procedural frameworks. So the idea is that we want state and non-state to support each other to do the work that they're best adapted to. For example, the state system could be in charge of prosecution for law and order problems and the custom system for maintaining peace in the community. In terms of trying to think about the sorts of reforms that need to be done, one of the things that I've considered is how to redraft that section 151 of the penal code to make better provision for the fact that you can't actually prove that somebody has committed sorcery. However, I've argued that if you concentrate instead on the intention of the defendant to do harm through sorcery, then you can overcome that problem. I've also worked on altering the law of defences to make them to take a belief of sorcery into account, to make the law in the state courts more legitimate and more in accordance with people's own beliefs of what is right and what is wrong. And I've also advocated the need to have a joint approach of using both the state and the non-state system to work together to tackle these problems. And in fact, these issues are now being taken up and the Law Reform Commission in Papua New Guinea is currently um, looking at how to improve the law regarding sorcery. And just recently in Vanuatu as well, uh, there's been a, a mandate given to the um, Department of Justice to look at how to improve the sorcery laws. So these are um, pretty current events in the um, Pacific Island region. So watch this space, I guess, to see um, how things go from here. Thank you. Good. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the lovely weather here. I'm Lennon Chan, and I'm now a research officer at RegNet. Um, I'm now um, working on a project involving cybercrime and organized crime. As Veronica just said, I completed my PhD at RegNet last year. And based, my, based on my experience, I should say, if you are interested in doing research in regulatory science, RegNet is the best place you have to do your <laughs> research. Um, today my presentation is based on my PhD and uh, my fieldwork experience. There will be two parts of today's presentation. I'll start with a briefing on my research and I would like to spend some time telling you about my um, experience doing research in China. Um, my PhD research entitled Subcrime Across the Taiwan Strait Regulatory Responses and Crime Prevention involved um, cr comparative criminology research based on qualitative research in the Greater China region. It aimed to identify and assess the viability of um, regulatory and other responses the, the government agencies and private companies can undertake to combat cybercrime. Under a special political situation between Taiwan and China where uh, formal mutual assistance might not be feasible and workable between the two governments, it considered how to establish a feasible pre-warning system and how to encourage the public and private sectors to cooperate in strengthening their capacity against cybercrime. The thesis begins with an account of extent and nature of cybercrime between Taiwan and China, especially on the prevalence of net in Taiwan and China. Following the structure of routine activity theory and given the existence of motivated offenders, it Analyze, uh, uh, analysis um, chi Chinese and um, Taiwanese legal responses to cybercrime, mutual assistance between the two countries and co uh, cooperation through a third party to determine if there are alternative capital guardians. Inspired by the concept of a risk commonwealth, that is, the proper um, assessment and management of risk is now commonwealth that the state and its citizens should seek to, provo uh, to promote and defend, it not only suggested the desirability of a pre-warning system between the government agencies and private companies to build up resilience and make targets less vulnerable and suitable. <coughs> it also examined concerns and incentives to attract organizations to participate and share information on security incidents. Um, for research purpose, the research uh, my thesis did not address conventional crime facilitated by computers and internet, such as um, like online drug dealing, um, dissem disseminating child pornography, online gambling. Um, the narrative of the cybercrime discussed in my thesis mainly focused on topics related to new types of, uh, of crime, such as hacking, 
I should show you the photo first. The hacking. <laughs> Understand? And this is the, 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 the website, a, a, a Taiwanese government website, which has been hacked by the Chinese hacker. And there was a time when the, um, uh, the city in Taiwan called Kaohsiung invited both Dalai Lama and Libya to Taiwan to do a speech. So they just put on the, a photo like this, and the words on the suicide is not is some some big comment. So um, I, I think I don't need to explain it. <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> yeah. So um, after examining the computer malicious activities legal responses and law enforcement measures against cybercrime in Taiwan and China. My thesis argues that um, um, there is an urgent need to establish a feasible pre-warning system and to make potential target less vulnerable. Because many people, including government agencies and companies, use proprietary software, like what we are using Microsoft or uh, Word or Windows, Malicious activity in cyber space, in cyber world, has the characteristic of an infectious disease pandemic. When it happens, the consequences can be widespread and damaging because it spreads so quickly. It is important to establish measures to prevent malicious activities from disseminating and thereby minimize the damage and loss to society. In my thesis, I propose a wiki approach I think a weaker approach is essential and a feasible pre-warning system is needed for effective um, cybercrime prevention. That is, cybercrime prevention needs to involve all users in cooperative efforts with warnings and information on countermeasures sent out to prevent the disease, disease from spreading when users encounter an attack. Of course, the issue on how to improve the reporting uh, system such as eliminating the, repu the reputational concerns, hydro-headed reporting system are discussed in my thesis. And based on the regulatory pyramid, which we would like to use in RegNet, and the strength-based pyramid, as you can see on the PowerPoint, the thesis disc also discussed the pros and cons of using compulsory or voluntarily reporting schemes and learning from the U.S. aviation safety reporting system. This thesis argues that a non-coercive approach, such as giving praise and providing technical support, can help to make the system or the scheme more effective. Um, the methodology of this thesis included qualitative interviews, secondary data analysis, and the study of comparative law. As can be seen on the PowerPoint, um, eight, uh, 38 interviews with 44 interviewees, including police officers, prosecutors, cybercrime experts, and those in charge of information security problems in both government agencies and private companies, were conducted in Taiwan, China, and Hong Kong. Um, based on the sens uh, sensitivity of the topic, as well as the, of, as well as the sensitivity of my identity, my nationality. It is very difficult actually for me to do my field work in China, China on this topic. When I first went to China, no one was willing to talk to me on this topic. And actually, without trust and, and guanxi, which is similar concept to social capital or relation, it's, it would be difficult for everyone to do research in China. Apart from that, um, I, actually, I feel that um, people in China are not comfortable to be interviewed. However, as mentioned earlier, the research ends up having uh, 15 interviews with 18 interviewees in China. I was more than, um, that was more than actually what I expected. Um, here I would like to, pro to show you some experience about my, my field work um, um, ex um, um, experience and how it ended up with um, 18 people that are willing to be interviewed. If you plan to um, do field work in China, try to stay longer, like what Ross did, and try to build up guanxi with some um, potential interviewees. <laughs> this can be done through like um, having meals or drinks or coffee together. <laughs> Don't laugh, that's serious. <laughs> Giving small presents when you visit them, or, or just try to visit them as, as, much as, as many times as possible. 
Of course, you can you can also go uh, go through your friends and ask them to introduce his friends to you. However, this kind of guanxi or, or cap, social capital won't build up just because someone introduced you to someone. You still need to like devote yourself, talking to him, visit him, do what I, I just said. And you have to um, maintain and improve the relationship yourself. Although it's important um, for you to divide your field work into several times, if you've got enough grounds to go. You will find the change of the attitude of your potential interviewees every time when you visit them. Because they come <coughs> acquainted to you every time when you, uh, the, 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 the relationship improves every time when you visit them. So they will become, I, for my experience, they, they, are, they, they become more friendly and, and, and more willing to talk to me than the previous time I visited them. I think I'm running out of time. I'll leave it here. If you are interested in my topic, actually there will be another pre presentation on this topic on the um, China Study Association of Australia on 14th July. Okay, thank you for your time. Good afternoon everyone, I'm Judith Healy and I'm going to talk about who gets good health care in Southeast Asian countries. Now I probably don't need to point out to people here that this is a very diverse region. Uh, many of you are, are visiting for, from these countries and the, the region's seen rapid change in, in the last few decades. There's been a, a demographic transition, uh, people are living longer, women are having fewer children, there's been a socio-economic transition, uh, rapid economic growth with uh, less poverty but um, increasing inequity in, in many countries as the gap between the rich and the poor has been uh, widening. And rapid urbanisation as people move from uh, uh, rural to, to urban areas. Uh, it's also undergoing an epidemiological transition. Uh, the burden of disease has been shifting from infectious to chronic diseases like heart disease, stroke, cancers. But infectious disease, what we've realised in, in, in the last few years, is also of a big concern because the region is a hot spot for um, new and emerging diseases. And we only have to think of uh, SARS and avian flu uh, and the potential for pandemics to spread around the world. So, you know, countries like Asia and Europe have got a lot more interested in healthcare systems in Asian countries and their ability to set up good surveillance. So for quite selfish reasons, there's a lot of interest by the rich countries in healthcare systems of the poorer countries, apart from you know, humane and, uh, and development aid uh, considerations. So we're seeing a transition in, in healthcare systems. Governments in the region uh, uh, have begun to accept that they are the stewards for the, the health of the populations in their countries. They might not deliver healthcare services themselves, but it's the responsibility of government to, to try and make sure that people have access to good, to good healthcare. Also, there's rising public expectations. People have greater expectations that they, sh that they should be able to get uh, healthcare when they need it. So I'm going to mainly uh, confine my comments to the ASEAN region, and here's another map of, uh, that covers the, uh, the, the, the 10 countries, the 10 uh, uh, ASEAN countries, which are uh, Australia's northern neighbours. I don't think ASEAN's let Australia into the club yet, but uh, uh, despite our uh, foreign affairs minister trying from time to time to, to get in, saying oh, that we're all... Uh, we're all Asian. Um, so it's a diverse region. It ranges from very rich countries like Singapore uh, through Malaysia and Cambodia. And I've just picked out three examples here taking the World Bank classification of a high income country like uh, Singapore, uh, an upper middle income country like Malaysia, which has seen very rapid economic uh, growth one of the so-called uh, Asian tiger economies, and, and a low-income country uh, like Cambodia. And you can see when you look at life expectancy that we're talking about a 20-year gap in life expectancy between uh, a rich, the rich and the poor countries uh, in, the, in the ASEAN region. 
Uh, some countries are increasingly ur urbanised and industrialised, uh, like Singapore. Uh, but then look at Cambodia, where uh, um, uh, only 15, you know, it's mainly a, a poor and uh, rural uh, a population with just a small proportion so far living in cities. But, but there is um, quite a lot of migration go go going on in the area. And some of that's reflected in infant mortality. And you can see that uh, 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 deaths per thousand life births among infants is, is very small in Singapore, as it is in, in Australia and other OECD countries. But look at Cambodia, with uh, uh, 50 deaths uh, per uh, thousand uh, life births. So, you know, major problem still with in, with infant mortality. Uh, how much do, pe do these countries spend on health care? Well, uh, Singapore can uh, 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 afford to spend a lot per capita. Uh, Malaysia and Cambodia are, sp are spending much less. A big issue is to what extent governments are funding their healthcare systems or whether it's all coming from private health expenditure. Uh, so in all of these countries, uh, over, over half to three quarters of the funds for healthcare are coming from private sources. And if you compare that to Australia, where about a third uh, to, where government funds about two thirds of healthcare services in these countries, which is also the case in, in, in most OECD countries, except for the United States, which is an outlier, as we know, with a very expensive uh, private healthcare system. It is, a, it is a major problem if a lot of the private healthcare uh, uh, is coming out of people's pockets. If individuals themselves are having to make out of pocket payments for healthcare, and as you can imagine, that can be catastrophic for, for poor families if they've got to pay for hospital visits, uh, inpatient stays, or a lot of visits to a doctor. So the amount that's spent on out of, the, the amount that comes out of pocket of, of people from people is a major equity issue for, for healthcare policy. Uh, and also um, their, their um, human resources. You know, how many doctors and nurses have they, have they got to? Um, to deliver health care to, to the population. And as you can see, uh, only about 1.1 uh, per thousand doctors and nurses in, in Cambodia, not, not, uh, not many. So for, for, so for reasons of equity and, and diversity, um, uh, just last month, uh, uh, an Asia-Pacific Observatory on Health Systems and Policies was established. And the idea is to um, provide information to policy, information and evidence to policy makers in the region who are, who are all in, in different ways looking to reform and improve their healthcare systems. So this is one of these partnership organisations uh, made up from the World Health Organisation, World Bank, Asian Development Bank, uh, AusAid, several governments and, uh, and a couple of universities. So the idea is to do reports and analyses, uh, research what's happening with, with healthcare in the countries in, in, in the region and to um, uh, get going a, a better dialogue between researchers and the people who make uh, health health policy. So I, I've emphasised the diversity in the region, but really there are common issues. And here are, are some of the questions that researchers in uh, health policy and health systems are interested in. Firstly, well, how best to fund healthcare systems? Should should they be funded out of general revenue taxation? out of social health insurance, like out of payroll tax, uh, private health insurance, should it be mainly out of pocket, as, as it is in many of these poorer countries, or aid from donors. And uh, every country varies a bit in, in, in how they fund their health care, and a lot of factors enter into it, like how easy it is to collect taxes. Many of these countries have a very large informal sector. It's difficult to collect taxes from, private, uh, uh, from privately employed people. It also depends a bit on the, uh, the culture of taxation compliance in a country. Uh, this isn't a problem just in Asia. Think of Greece. Uh, they've had decades of making a tax evasion a national sport there. <laughs> 
Uh, another big issue is how to manage the public-private mix, because in all of these countries the private health care sector is, uh, is, is growing. And how do you, how do you staff health care? We, we have shortages of uh, health professionals in many countries of the world now. And what we're seeing is a brain drain in, in, the, in the ASEAN region countries as doctors and nurses move from poorer to richer countries, which is not surprising if, if richer countries can you know, pay you a better salary and, and provide you with a more satisfying uh, uh, um, workplace. Uh, we're seeing a shift of healthcare staff from, from public to private services and the growth of medical tourism. So, for example, Thailand and Malaysia are positioning themselves as providers of private healthcare to other people in the region, and their top end hospital are employing a lot of uh, doctors from uh, uh, other, other, other countries who can provide healthcare to uh, richer tourists. Context is, is really crucial. Uh, so, in looking at health policies and programs, you know, what works in one country might not work in another. It depends very much on its history, culture, politics, the sort of healthcare system that it has. So, you can't necessarily pick up, you know, a good idea from one country and translate it to another. P people within each country have to look at what, what, what can be adapted. It's important to learn from each other, to learn from other countries, but also be able to adapt. Uh, an in increasingly important question now is how to regulate for, for good and safe health care. Uh, regulation becomes a lot more important also with the growth of private health care. So although uh, financing, you know, how you, who pays for health care is a, a perennial and an important topic, more attention in the regions now moving to, well, okay, is it good quality health care? Uh, are we getting good quality? Uh, are we getting um, um, uh, quality for, for our money? And this is extremely important. If you don't have much money to spread around, you have to make sure that you get the best, um, uh, the best from it. So I want to move now and talk about regulation in relation to patient safety, because this is an area I've been uh, working on for, for the last five years. So for example, medical errors, which we now called adverse events. How safe is, is health care? Now there's been a lot of research done on health care in modern hospitals in high income countries. And if any of you are unlucky enough to be admitted to a hospital, you have a more than one in ten chance of something going wrong that shouldn't. Which is a bit of a shock because we assume that you know doctors are these wonderful beings who never make mistakes. Well they do. And, and in busy hospitals, a lot of things can go wrong. So I've just put up a, a slide giving you uh, examples of the sorts of adverse events that can occur in hospitals, medication errors, um, uh, surgical errors. But I want to draw your attention to just one in particular now, and that is hospital-caused infections, hospital-associated infections. And that's an increasing problem as we have more antibiotic resistance uh, around the world. Uh, you admitted to hospital, there's a lot of other sick people with infectious uh, diseases going on, so you know, you're more likely to catch things. Plus, a lot, a lot of the diseases now are, are resistant to antibiotics because there have been such profligate use of antibiotics. So in, 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 high income, in modern hospitals and high income countries, over, well, nearly 10% of patients uh, are at risk of getting a, a hospital acquired infection. It's much higher, much, much higher in developing countries. Uh, there have been a, a, a small number of studies recently that show that you know, between 15 to 25 per cent of patients will get an infection at hosp in hospital. They're okay when they went in, but they uh, you know, get a, a, another infection on top of it. Now that's a big problem. So the World Health Organization is making this a, a number one campaign. Uh, and that's sensible uh, because this is an issue for developing countries as well as high income countries. All hospitals can do something about it. So they've got a campaign about clean care as safer care. Now that means really basic stuff like making sure that doctors and nurses wash their hands before examining patients. You would think that would be standard and we've known about that for a very long time. but 
it's easy for very busy people to forget about this. So they're really pushing this, this very basic message, wash your hands before examining a patient. There have been a few studies that show healthcare staff often wash their hands after examining the patient. No, no, before. You know, worry about the patient, not about yourself. <laughs> So what types of, regula uh, of regulation will improve patient safety? And this is all around the world, not, not just in, um, in uh, the Asia Pacific region. Well, first of all, strengthening governance. And this is what the group in the Regulatory Institutions Network are really interested in. Um, so governments in many countries are strengthening their regulation of healthcare performance by passing legislation, by requiring hospitals to publish their success rates, you know, like uh, what proportion of uh, medical errors go in on your hospital, um, how good, it, uh, good are you in uh, successful surgery, uh, by establishing regulatory agencies who collect information and, and, and publish this more transparent um, uh, uh, performance assessments, and making the health professions and the health industry more accountable. It's also important to design safe systems uh, hospitals and equipment procedures uh, have been really slow in, uh, to, 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 to uh, design for safety. And healthcare can be a risky business, as I, as I think I've uh, now persuaded you. Unlike other high-risk industries, health sector has been slow to reduce risks because it assumes that doctors and nurses are, 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 are these supermen and superwomen who don't make errors uh, against all that. Uh, Evidence and 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 uh, and, uh, um, and and you know against human nature. Uh, it's also important to promote a patient safety culture to encourage the medical uh, culture to promote patient-centred healthcare. So put patients first, not staff first. So regulation um, can 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 range from persuasion at the, the bottom of a regulatory pyramid right up to, to passing legislation and command and control sort of regulation at the at the top. So this is an example of, of one of these uh, regulatory pyramids that we rather like in Regnet. Um, we all we all do pyramids. Occasionally, I do circles as well, just for, for, for a bit of variety. But I'm sticking to pyramids today. So right at the top, you can have command and control sort of regulatory action. You pass legislation, you fine people if they don't do the right thing. Uh, so it's enforcement by government or its, or its agents. Coming down, you, you have meta-regulation. Uh, you might set up an, an external regulator who will um, publish performance indicators on hospitals. So you can go to a website and see, well, you know, which is the hospital that give, will give me the best and safest health care. You might have a partnership between external and internal regulators, and that, that's extremely important in, in the health care area, uh, where professional associations are very strong, and after all, there are very strong uh, ethical uh, standards uh, in nursing and, and, and medical associations and all of the other associations of, of, of uh, healthcare professionals, and you want to build on those strengths. There's also self-regulation, where you would leave it to an association of hospitals, for example, to, to try and regulate their members. Market mechanisms are important. Um, you could uh, maybe refuse to pay for unsafe healthcare, which is what some in, of the insurance funds in the United States are doing. Or voluntarism, an individual voluntarily undertakes to do the right thing. And that is particularly important in, in all areas of regulation, and I think particularly in, in, in the healthcare sector. And it's a pyramid because you want to drive down regulation to the base. You want most of the regulation to go on at the, the, the cheapest and most respectful end of the pyramid. That's where we want to see most of the activity, but we want to have the ability to move up the pyramid if people aren't doing the, the right thing. So one of the other, one of the strategies at the top of the pyramid, of course, would be to sue your doctor or hospital if they don't do the right thing. So my question is, do lawyers get safer health care? This cartoon asks, wait, this one's a lawyer, we'd better wash our hands. <laughs> and here's a couple of references. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, my name is Jeroen van der Heide. 
I'm uh, going to talk you through um, a part of my research at RecNet, which is about volunteerism um, at the bottom of the latest pyramid, so thanks for covering that ground for me. Um, and my question here is, is there a role for volunteerism in ecological sustainable development in Asia and the Pacific? If we look at the 20th century, we see a growth of basically everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, this, is, this is the 20th century. Population growth, industrialization, urbanization, but at the same time, we see a lot of problems, a lot of growth in problems, and especially in sustainability. More waste is being produced, more pollution, more energy is being consumed. And we all know that you know, this is one of the major uh, social risks we are currently facing. And we recognize this at RecNet, and we study these things. At the same time, we see that policymakers, NGOs, and industries have big dreams. And I refer to these as utopian visions. In China, there are major utopian visions on building enormous eco-cities, cities in which millions of people can live together in a very environmental sustainable way, so that they can work, live, you know, to, that, that, that they can work and live together in, 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 in harmony with nature, not polluting the world too much as we are supposed to do. Other people, and most of the time these are NGOs, have smaller dreams, but still these are utopias. This is a, is a utopia or a small dream in Bangladesh, in which a local NGO dreams about a more sustainable approach to, um, to water management, to ensure that the local people in, Bang in Bangladesh have a very high quality of water within, um, within their area. What we question, and not only we at RecNet, but what policymakers, industry stakeholders and NGOs question is how can we realize these utopias, how can we realize these dreams? And if you then look at regulatory literature, you find that environmental issues are very difficult to tackle um, with regulations only. So where we used to look at regulation as what, what has already been taught, command and control systems, systems in which the state set up, sets up regulations and enforces these, we tend to see that environmental issues are too wicked. They are wicked problems. The, 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 problem in, the, the, the problems in the environmental area are hard to solve. And pretty often it is because there are so many people involved, there are so many interests involved. But one of the major issues is that every problem comes with, or, or every solution comes with more problems. So as soon as you tackle a part of the problem, you find that there are more problems to solve, wicked problems. And the problem with wicked problems is that tr the, the traditional approaches don't really work. So where we used to think of regulation and governance as a thing being done by the state or by governments and um, setting up regulations which non-state actors had to follow, we see that in environmental issues there is a tendency to look at collaboration between the two. We hope that if the state and non-state actors, if governments, industry stakeholders and NGOs work together, that they can come up with better governance systems. Systems that can really address these environmental issues. And one of the um, governance arrangements I like to look at, and one of the governance arrangements that a lot of policymakers and industry stakeholders like to look at is volunteerism. And volunteerism here may be understood as a way to increase the environmental performance of people, industries, but also of state stakeholders without any legislation, without any deterrence coercion by um, legislation. Of course, when we scholars look at a phenomenon such as volunteerism, we tend to define these in different aspects or different categories. Um, and within the studies on volunteerism, you could distinguish between de facto volunteerism, governance and agreements, and pure volunteerism or self-regulation. And they all have their own way of addressing environmental uh, problems. Um, the first one, de facto volunteerism, may be understood as an approach in which the government still sets up regulations, but doesn't really enforce these. And we see a lot of examples of these. We see examples of regulations being in place, organizations having to follow these regulations, but they aren't being enforced, and still these organizations do comply with these regulations. Why should they? 
And why do they? This is a very, very intriguing question. Why do people comply with regulations without being enforced? De facto voluntarism. Another example are governance and agreements. And in this example or, or in this type of governance and agreements, we see that state and non-state actors come together, they come to agreements on how to address certain environmental risks. And over here in Australia, we have the National uh, uh, Packaging Covenant. And in the National Packaging Covenant, um, state and non-state stakeholders came to an agreement on how to reduce the impact of packaging. There aren't really formal regulations on this, there isn't formal legislation on it, but still industry stakeholders see that they have to address the environmental impact of packaging and they came to an agreement with, go with, with governments. To me, the most intriguing one is pure voluntarism or self-regulation or um, whatever you want to uh, name it. And this is where industry stakeholders, without any help, without any support, without any pressure from governments, set up their own regulations, enforce these amongst their own group, and by so truly address the environmental issues we face, the environmental problems we face. And what is interesting about um, this area is that we see various examples of pure voluntarism pop up everywhere, all over the world and also over here in Asia and the Pacific. And these are a number of green building certification schemes. And a green building certification scheme basically sets regulations on the environmental performance of buildings. People build a building, apply for a certain rating. It is, the, the building is being um, assessed and depending on how sustainable the building is, you get a certain rating. The first um, Green Star Enviro Development are Australian examples. The other ones are examples throughout Asia. And what is interesting about this is that these programs have developed all independently. So at the same period of time, within the last 10 years, we see these programs pop up everywhere. Um, we don't know yet whether or not they really work. And that is one of the major issues in the studies on voluntarism. Does voluntarism really work? A part of the literature tells us it does, another part of the literature tells us it doesn't. So the question therefore is, under what circumstances and where does voluntarism work? Another major issue with voluntarism at the moment and the studies on voluntarism is that the current theory is very Western oriented. Basically all examples, basically all theorizing is built on uh, Anglo-Saxon or other um, uh, Western examples, Northern European examples. So for you as future scholars in Asia and the Pacific, I would like to raise two questions. Um, I really hope you would like to take up the questions in voluntarism and strive to find what works and where, which we would call empirical generalization. What type of voluntary programs work and where in Asia and the Pacific? I think more intriguingly and more interestingly is the theoretical generalization. Given that so much of the current theorizing is based on Western examples, we could question whether or not voluntarism also may, pri may, may provide a solution to many of the environmental issues Asia and the Pacific faces. So therefore, do these Western-based theories also apply in Asia and the Pacific? And if we can find answers to these questions, I hope that when somebody in the next century gives this presentation, that he, can, he or she can show this graph and could tell that in the 21st century, we've seen a lot of growth, but we've also seen a decline of the environmental impact people um, pose on the natural environment. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much. We've gone from uh, sorcery to wicked problems. Uh, we have time for uh, questions and comments. If you'd like to uh, raise a question, identify yourself and tell us who you'd like to direct the question to. We'll take a couple of questions uh, to let the panellists think about the, the responses. I'll cluster them and then I'll ask the panel to respond. Over here, sir. Um, my first question, there was just two. Oh, should I make it Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Ross, as Lennon introduced. Um, my first question uh, is to Dr. Hillary, and it was in relation to, uh, sort of in two parts, in relation to metadata. 
uh, meta regulation. In Southeast Asia, a lot of the countries, as you pointed out, are quite poor. So if we're using meta regulation, I'm wondering how this would be distributed in a practical sense to the general population. But also, with the issue of research around healthcare, is there a practical way we could actually get some of these um, medical issues dealt with, such as, like, you, you see innocence projects used in law and internships where you, you put students in and helping them. And I'm thinking along that line. The other quick question is just to Lennon. You talk about um, going into country, and it's very important if you do research in country to, to get a feel of what's going on and the importance of relationship. I was wondering, some of the issues you had in China, is it the fact that you were an outsider or lower, as the Chinese would say, or is it more the fact that there's this tension across the Taiwan Strait? Thanks. Over here. First of all, thank you for all the um, very uh, fantastic presentations, and I've learned a lot. Um, my, my questions and comments are just for the for Dr. Lenon Chang, and particularly relevant to the second part of your presentation. Uh, first, you, you, you addressed that the um, uh, relationship of Guanxi is very important um, for researchers in China or doing research on China. I totally agree with that. Um, but I'm also thinking about, on the other hand, um, would this approach a bit uh, risky because um, sometimes as a social scientist, you have to be uh, not only value free, but when you choose your cases, when you choose your uh, interviewees, you have to follow a certain kind of rules there. So uh, could you give some suggestions on how to balance the practical consideration and the academic requirement there? especially on uh, selecting interviewees, because apparently if you select all interviewees among your friends, there are very likely you will have some bias there. Well, of course, it's relevant on your question. The other thing is you mentioned about that um, uh, at the beginning, some people talk to you, they talk, they might say it's unseen, and as time, time goes by, as your relation should be them getting stronger, they may say other things. Um, I, I had this experience as well, but I'm thinking about, but, whether or not this itself is kind of interesting research itself because um, how people, how, what, the people's discourse may be different from their actual uh, consideration and, and why it's different, how it's different and how it changes is also interesting research questions as well. Thank you. Thanks. We'll take one more uh, question for the panel. Uh, we'll, we'll take two more. We'll take over here and uh, in the middle over there. Thanks. Hi, my name is Scott Young. I'm from Vancouver. Um, Dr. Chang, my question is for you on the uh, role of state-sanctioned cyber crime in China. There's reports of um, prison guards in China using prisoners for online gold mine, gold farming. Mm -hmm. And if you're asking the Chinese government to regulate cyber crime, then what role does that play in terms of um, corruption and so on? And actually, any other thoughts you have on the broader implications of uh, cyber security? I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Brooke Nolan and I'm from University of Western Australia. Um, my question is for Miranda. Um, I work in Indonesia uh, where there are hundreds of different types of sorcery or black magic systems going on, um, none of which have been incorporated into the legal system. And so I wanted to ask you um, something about the history behind how and when sorcery um, was incorporated into the legal system and um, was it a top-down approach? Was it sort of imposed uh, from politicians? Um, or was this something that people uh, in Vanuatu wished to have um, incorporated in, in the legal system? Um, also, is sorcery um, what sort of diversity do you find in, in sorcery and black magic systems in the country and how does um, the, uh, the legal code sort of deal with uh, diversity um, and what issues of power and class are going on in terms of um, the sorcery that you mentioned? Thank you. 
These are terrific questions. They're also fairly complex. So I'm going to invite our panel to uh, respond, but respond succinctly so that we have time for another round. Judith. Uh, okay, the first question. You know, how, how can a country with not much money and, and, not, and, 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 uh, and shortages of professional staff go about regulating the healthcare system? Well, of course, they've got to look for, uh, for, for feasible and, and cheaper ways of doing it. They're not going to be able to do it uh, through sophisticated you know, computer monitoring systems as, as we do. Uh, to some extent in Australia and, and other European countries because uh, um, uh, the hospitals often, often don't have computers, for, for one thing. So meta-regulation is about, is about an external regulator uh, making the internal regulators more accountable. So what you'd be interested in is promoting strong professional associations. Now that's all, always got a downside because they also have <coughs> trade unions, of course. But you, you, you know you, you want them to take more responsibility for regulating their own members. You'd be looking to encourage uh, voluntary industry associations who would take more responsibility for making sure their member hospitals or member um, doctors' clinics uh, took more responsibility for uh, uh, for monitoring what goes on. Um, so to give you an example, it's actually an interesting Netherlands example. They've got a, a visitati program where the different professional groups uh, go around and visit each of the hospitals. So the, the orthopaedic surgeons will all go around and visit the, uh, a, a small group of orthopaedic surgeons would, would visit the uh, orthopaedic sections of the, of the hospitals and write a report on, on how well they're doing. So a lot of peer pressure, and that works really well with doctors. <laughs> Um, also, you might look at encouraging patients to, you know, patients can be regulatory actors. Now, we're beginning to try that in, um, in, um, in many countries. So, for example, there was a survey in, in the UK that says, okay, if, if a doctor or nurse came in to e examine you, is it important for a patient to remind them to, uh, to, to clean their hands? If, you know, if they hadn't, everyone said, yes, yes, oh, yes, it's important. Yes. And then the question was, well, would you remind them? Oh, no, no, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't like to challenge or criticise a doctor or nurse. So it's all about trying to make, uh, encourage patients to, um, to, to empower patients, really, to give them more information and to empower them, you know, it, it's okay to raise questions about your own healthcare. You are a partner. In, in, in the healthcare that you're, you're, you're getting. So there's a lot of different different strategies that we work in developing as well as our high income countries. How do you go about doing a research in this area? Well, there's lots of different avenues. You know, you might come out of a legal area or health economics or uh, you know, it doesn't just have to be a, a medical school. Um, so there's, there's lots of so sociology. Lots of different different areas. Ethical clearance is always a bit of a problem. It was more translating the, the theory into practice as opposed to how to go about the theory. Sorry. The theory into practice. Yeah. Uh, well, certainly lots of opportunities if you work in, in, in the healthcare area. And again, it's about empowering individuals within the healthcare system. So, for example, there's a, um, a patient identification protocol before surgery, that, that, that the, the protocol says, okay, before you cut into the patient, stop and ask, have I got the correct patient? Am I about to do a procedure on the correct side? Is this the correct procedure? And they're trying to empower nurses to say, whoops, you know, excuse me, Mr. So-and-so surgeon, uh, this is, uh, uh, we don't have the correct, uh, this is the wrong patient, or this should be on the left side, not the right side. Uh, uh, but medical culture, you know, it has to change to, to accept that healthcare it is a team, a team business these days. It's not just about one professional delivering service, it's about a team and all the members of the team should have a say in what, what, what goes on. Super, thank you. I'm going to ask you to pass to Lennon. Thank you for all the questions. Um, I'm quite surprised they were getting a lot of questions. <laughs> Okay, I'll combine the first question and then Ross asked this uh, question. Um, I think, yes, outside is a question, not only to Taiwanese. 
But what happens to me is my, as my topic is very sensitive on some time. And when I was there, I was actually, I think I sort of being recognized as spy. <laughs> So every time when I, when, I, when I go in China, I got some check at the customs. So I think that's not only to the question of our editor. My, my, my nationality um, added the sensitivity of the whole question. And for um, the lacking of interview, uh, interviewees and uh, interview your own friends in, in terms of um, cyber crime in China, I think it differs between, uh, from discipline to discipline. I, I, was, uh, I was giving the same topic, um, I was talking about the same topic last year, Asia Pacific Week, and it was in the occasion of uh, anthropologist section. So the, the chair told me that, no, oh, just talk to someone who wants to talk to us. Because you can't get, it, it would be good if you can talk to the ones you want to talk to, but there's no such thing especially for this kind of sensitive top topic. So what I do is I approach the ones I want to talk to and I try to build up the relationship with the target I want to talk to. So I'm not, I'm not selecting my friends as my, my, my interviewees, but I may select someone that I want to talk to as close to my friends. So then I uh, minimize the risk, what you just mentioned about um, maybe your friend of mine. And there might be some ethical issues <coughs> inside. And another question is that um, for for interviews, you can only talk to someone who is volu voluntarily want, who is voluntarily talk talk to you. I try to go through the um, formal process. I, I, I was going to interview a, pro a prosecutor, and he he agreed to be interviewed, but he told me that I need to send out a formal letter to his boss, and once his boss approved, he talked to me. But what happens to me is that yes, I get it. But you, what he told me is all the, what what you can read on on, on the on, on published papers. So it doesn't mean anything to me in terms of doing interview. But uh, yeah, there's there's always a limitation you can you can do. Like, for the, if you can't approach the one you want to talk to, or you you are looking of interviews, you just put you might just put it in the. Um, research limitation. And for qualitative interviews, there's always an exploring topic. You can't use it to generalize the whole situation. So maybe you can follow up the research you've done this time to do enough to establish another uh, research to like, fill up the, 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 the uh, risk or, or the lack that happens. And for the goal farming, that's a very interesting topic. I think um, what I propose in my thesis is that um, we nowadays it's quite difficult for us to really find out who is the criminal. When, when, we, read, when we read the newspapers, we can see a lot of um, Western countries criticizing China, supporting the cyber crime, cyber war, cyber terrorism, whatever. But um, I, I've mentioned briefly about the bonnet. That's kind of organized crime that you. People can use other people's computer to 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 as a springboard to attack um, someone else's computer. And according to my research, I think uh, as you might all know that um, there are a lot of bot infected computers in China. They might be controlled by the U.S., might be controlled by Taiwanese, might be controlled by Australia. Who knows? Then in this case, of course, China can say no. I'm not. I'm not supporting them. You have to give me the, the real evidence showing that I am the one who is supporting that. So in my thesis, I think there is no capable guardians in cyberspace. It will be difficult for us to really find out who is the criminal. That is the reason why I, I draw back to, 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 to propose the idea with crime prevention. I think it's important like, to, to build up the safeguard cyberspace. We don't have to really, we don't need uh, although criticizing the criminal is important, but what I talk in my thesis, what, what I discuss in my thesis is more on how we secure it. I don't, I don't want, to, I don't want to talk about the criminals. We can't find it.
Terrific. Thanks very much. I'm going to exercise a little bit of command and control here. Uh, Miranda, you were asked a, a really uh, interesting but complex question, and in the interests of time, I'm going to ask you to give a really succinct response. Thanks. Um, so, yes, uh, uh, the interaction of sorcery as a crime in Vanuatu was very much a top-down approach at independence, but a lot of legislation has been drafted. However, since then, there has been a popular movement, and particularly the chiefs have been calling for assistance in dealing with this as a problem. So that's why I have recently said to the Justice Minister, uh, or the ex-Justice Minister, there's been several changes of government in the last couple of months, saying we want to have more legislation about this. There's many different sorts of black magic, good, bad, love, and finding things, very useful finding things magic. <laughs> and um, it is related to power and class. It used to be a control, a form of social control that was exercised by community leaders, and nowadays it's just spread throughout, so it's broken out of its boundaries, which is related to some of the problems. I've written an article about this that was published in Law Asia, so if you're interested, looking at that and I'm also planning to do a comparative study looking at other countries in the region so if you're doing anything um, you know in Indonesia then please get in touch with me and, and see how we can go from there. Super. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry.